So I'm Clara Galan from Remind 101, and I'm joined here today by Andy Marcinick, who's the Director of Digital Learning and Technology at Groton Dunstable Regional School District in Boston, and a blogger for Remind 101. So welcome, Andy. How are you doing today? Good, Clara. Nice to see you. Great. So we're loving your perspective on technology integration in the classroom, as you've had experience both teaching in the classroom and as a tech director for a school district. And your latest article that you wrote for us um, about teaching digital literacy really touched on the importance of building students as digital citizens for 21st century learning. So how, what is digital citizenship? How would you define it? Um, I mean, at, at, I think at, at its core, it's, it's basically simply being nice to people. Um, it's, it's, it's really just about being nice. Um, but it, there are there are layers to that, and and some of those layers come with something that Alan November talked about years ago. He said the most important 21st century skill is empathy, and and I think that's a, a, a big piece to remember and to to realize that and get under, students to understand that every day every day skill sets and and pieces of civility and and like I said, just being nice are are transferable skills now to a digital world where we all need to be aware of. What we say online is is bigger than it's ever been. Um, if you are, you know, bullying somebody in person and you say something nice to that person, it's pretty much contained. Uh, the message is contained. It's still hurtful. It's still painful. Uh, emotions are affected, but it's it's contained. Um, what's happened now is that we're able to broadcast at, at an alarming rate. Um, we can broadcast anything. Um, students have access to the, these technologies. And most times they're brought into these tech, these digital worlds without any real um, understanding of repercussions or what's happening online and what it actually means um, until they're older. Um, I think a lot of what's happening in education is education's you know is treating this as a, a skill or a competency that students need to master. This idea of digital citizenship, um, the education world is is playing catch up to this this fast moving. Uh, these fast-moving digital worlds that our students are a part of on a daily basis from a very early age. So, um, you know, I think, you know, digital citizenship is something that is is, is, is key. Um, and, you know, I almost attribute it to, I, I like to phrase it as, is, is thinking of it like digital health and wellness, um, using the analogy of, of we, we, want, we constantly, for over the past five, six years, we wanted our kids to make healthy choices in the offline world, like for, for dietary uh, purposes. It was a big issue and a big concern in schools around around the world, uh, especially in America. And um, I think the same needs to be applied for for the digital world. So we want our students to make good choices. We want them to use it. We don't want to redact it from curriculum. We think it. I think it's important, and I think it should come in at a very early age, um, and something that should be threaded throughout the K twelve curriculum. Um, it shouldn't be an addition or an add on piece. It should be something that. Um, all teachers are aware of, and and if you're using technology, or even if you're not, um, that you know, this is this is very important. Well, I really like what you said about empathy and having that being translated into the digital world, because really what we're doing is we're teaching social and emotional learning now that the students are entering into that digital component. So, um, why would you say that it's really important for students to learn this? Like, how is this going to affect the rest of their lives? Well, I mean, I think it, it's it's starting to impact um, uh, you know the job market and and a lot of who we are. I mean, I, I think about my own personal um, learning it on on in digital spaces, and it's it's kind of like creating your brand. You've become your own advertising agency uh, all in one. Um, uh, if only if only they could have seen this in Mad Men, what was actually coming. But I mean, basically, it's it's I've created a brand. I feel like on using social media, I've been able to formulate and and shape my brand so that if somebody Google's me, they know that you know I I'm on Twitter and I'm usually posting good things. I also post a lot of food pictures, so they know that I love good food. Um, but that's me. That's my brand. Um, that I write for Edutopia. That I. I have a blog myself uh, that I write from Remind 101. So all these things are going to show up first, and um, those are you know I, I try and teach students about you know what are, what are your top five? What, what if somebody did a quick Google search for you? What are your top five? And so I think it's a it's a healthy balance of of educating students about digital worlds and what what it means and what it means to write and broadcast information 
live, um, but also realizing that it's not you don't always have to be on you don't always have to be on these on these in these worlds um, and to to develop a healthy balance between screen time and and not screen time whatever you want to call this that, that was bad but um, but yeah I think it's I think it's very important for kids to understand that you know not only colleges and universities are looking but the job market is aware of these worlds um, you know and pretty soon it's you know, the idea of submitting a resume is almost going to be non-existent. I mean, you think about how something like LinkedIn has has expanded exponentially over the past few years, and how everyone's dossier is up there. You can you can go and see what everyone's done. You can see their whole their whole career in in a matter of a few clicks, and and that's powerful. But it's also something you really need to understand and be aware of, so that with with so much access to information about people. Um, you, you really want to make sure students are are making those, like I said, healthy choices online, um, and they're making the right choices, but also at the same time understanding um, what it means to be um, a digital citizen. Yeah, I completely agree with you in that um, just having students, especially in middle school and high school, understanding what their digital footprint is going to be and applying to colleges, you know, and then the job market in the future, it's going to be really important. So, um, yeah. when do you think that should be taught across all content areas? So, how do we really teach digital citizenship and implement it? So, you know, is it just in certain subjects, or do you see it as something that's being taught across the entire curriculum? Yeah, and I think it's going to vary between schools and how their their curriculum set up. Um, uh, just to kind of give you an example, at, at Grand Dunstable, um, we you know we have students that have access to devices as early as kindergarten. And so some of the teaching moments there, they also have um, Google Apps for Education accounts created for them. Um, and so these accounts, before they're even turned on, I mean, to understand what it even means to have an account, um, what it means to have a username and a password. I mean, it wasn't so long ago, these like four or five years ago, these kids were actually just given names and now they have usernames. And so what does that mean? Um, and to kind of get them to understand is that you know, they have their names and they have their identity, but they also now have these places where they have to log in, they have to um, explore these these worlds. Um, and so what we do is we, you know, we're trying to teach kids how to even as simple as understanding how to create a password and, and uh, remember that password and to know that you shouldn't give that password out to someone. Um, so we also teach kids a lot of offline skill sets that we want to make sure they're transferable. Something as simple as, what is an email? What does it actually mean? Um, you know, teaching kids how to write a letter, teaching kids how to format an email, uh, showing them that you can't, if you're sending a professional email in an organization um, to a college professor or to someone you work with, you're not going to use texting language. You're not going to use truncated verbiage. You're going to actually need to use proper format, and that still applies. Um, you know, and so we're also, we're starting at, like I said, at very basic um, levels, but one project I've always done that really is a, is a great way of introducing a lot of technology skill sets without using any technology at all, and I, I, I think I referenced it in the, the Remind 101 piece uh, a few weeks ago uh, on the post you referred to earlier, and it basically, it's something you can, it's a, it's, a, it's a simulation you can do across all content areas, across all grades, and it involves easel paper and Sharpies, uh, and basically no talking. So what you do is you basically have the desk set up. When the kids come in, you have the easel paper, the, the big paper, uh, on the tables. And so say, for example, you're teaching English. And in the middle of those papers, you, the teacher would draw a circle and put a subject or maybe a quote or maybe a character. And all the students, you have different cohorts of students at different tables. And each of the different tables has you know, a different subject in the middle. And what you do is you, you basically reinforce the idea of we're going to be having a conversation through this easel paper, and what you're going to do is you're going to continue a conversation. So you're going to draw a line from the middle and make a comment or maybe a question, and then as the others see that, you're going to silently just watch and look and, and observe and make comments and add on and kind of keep a threaded discussion alive. And what you'll do is you'll have them do that for about five minutes and then they'll rotate and then they'll go and observe what the other group had written and then they'll 
elaborate upon that and, and add to that conversation. And this goes on, you know, they rotate every so often, and at the end you put it up on a, on a wall and you, you let students stand back and observe the conversations they had silently um, on easel paper. And just by explaining this, and if you've if ever spent one day in a digital world, you know exactly this, the skill sets that are, are already being happening are happening behind the scenes. I mean, most kids are going to encounter a college or uh, university that's going to have some type of online forum where they're going to have to engage in, a, in an online digital discussion where they're going to have to post and, and comment. Uh, many students are going to encounter a blog where they're going to have to understand what a comment is, who that person is that they don't know, um, what, a, what a network is, um, and basically that when you write something online, everyone can see it. So showing them that when you post everyone's work up on the wall, while you don't have your username associated to it, everyone's going to be able to see what you write. Um, and you're not always going to have control of the message. So when you send something out online, you, you kind of give up control um, of what the message can, can be. Um, and then I think it's, it's, it's very important to, to prep students and to get them to understand about um, negative commenting um, and what types of harassment and, and uh, uh, bullying can happen online. Um, and basically to, I think, instruct them in the basic level. I mean, it's something we're not going to be able to stop, but it's something we can uh, work in, in, in ways to, to mediate. And, and by saying so, what I'm, what I'm talking about is you know, teach the kids that if, if they see someone doing this or they know a peer of theirs that are, that are harassing someone online, that they need to tell someone. They need to tell an adult. I mean, that's something we have built into a lot of our um, acceptable use policies where, you know, it's kind of like that whole um, airport mentality. If you see something, say something. And so that's kind of what we want to instill in our kids because we're not going to stop bullying. We can we can educate students all they want, but there's there, it's going to happen. It's, it's, it's just it's part of growing up. I mean, I think it's 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 way too utopian to think that we're going to get to a world where, where you know, meanness is going to stop. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. But <laughs> um, we can teach kids best practices and, and show them how to how to understand these wounds and that and that you know to take the higher road and to tell someone to bring awareness to it so that it's not just affecting their emotions uh, and, and you know that being silent and taking that all in can really affect a student and there are numerous examples of that gone um, in, in very unfortunate directions uh, and so we want to hope that our students can be bring awareness to this and, and really um, vocalize their uh, when this is happening. Yeah, I love that. And just when students are building their digital footprint too and you were talking a little bit about best practices, um, I think there's a lot of power in that as well. I mean, students are having the opportunities to reach out to different figures that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And, you know, as you talked about blogging and building their own kind of personal brand, they're being able to influence so many more people and make learning authentic and real so that there's an actual audience for what they're doing. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and to kind of add to that, one, one piece I've always done, like, you know, once, like, whether it's middle school or... Or, or high school students that I've worked with, uh, you know, I've, I've used I've used my network of, of educators that I've established on on Twitter um, or even something like Google Plus, and and share their work. And then you know, it's I had I, you know I left comments, and I know that this is something that's happened a lot within you know personal learning networks on Twitter um, with different hashtags, and and a lot of people have been great in providing comments for my students um, and providing feedback, and you know. The questions you always get is, well, how do you know this person, or who is this person? And you know, sometimes I say I've never met this person. Um, I've only ever met them through an online medium, and that's, you know, maybe to some kids that they they say well, that's that's kind of weird. Like, why? How does? Um, but it shouldn't be. It's something where, you know, we all realize that we're in a professional, um, you know, professional context, and that's how we need to would keep it. And it's like I said. Building my brand and, and sharing online has, has helped me grow as a learner and as uh, an educator in numerous ways. I mean, that's a whole other Google Hangout to have someday. Um, but I think you want to be able to share that with the students and, and you know, um, and make sure they understand that this this medium 
social media can have a, have great impact on their on their careers. I mean, I've had examples of students that have used social media and that have gotten a message out or have been uh, doing great things um, by using this and by being transparent and by sharing their work, whether it's musically or artistically um, or or just simply writing. Um, and realizing that you can make connections. Uh, you can make connections with people who will look at your work or may want to offer you uh, an internship or, or a job. I mean, I've had several students that have leveraged this medium uh, for, for, that, for those purposes. And I mean, you can't give a better lesson than to have a student you know, out on Twitter or having a blog or a website and they get found and they're, they're now all of a sudden their careers in motion and that's great I mean that's you, you those examples you need to really collect those and share them as much as possible because it's 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 why we all use these tools and um, I think it's it's the it's the purpose for why we want our, our students to educate them about the the negative side of it but also realize that social media is very empowering uh, for a student voice yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying just with student voice that Students need to realize, you know, no matter what age group they're in, no matter what grade level, they have a huge impact on the world and should take hold of it. Um, and I like what you said, too, about, so in your school district, students learn digital citizenship from kindergarten all the way through. Um, and that activity you were talking about, which grade level did you um, do that with? Um, I worked with that, that particular lesson um, in my own classrooms as an English teacher before I was even... Um, you know, a tech specialist or, or a director, and uh, I've just shared that a lot, as much as I can. Um, so I, I worked with high school students with that, middle school students with that. Um, I've shared it with some of the teachers I work with now um, in, in kindergarten. And a lot of the things, a lot of the pieces, um, uh, we're, we're pretty much piloting this year. We're, we're, our district is relatively new to bringing in a lot of new technology. So um, we've also looked at our K through 12 scope and sequence um, uh, for digital and information literacy, and just to look at it and realize what what we expect our kids to be able to do as they pass on to the next level. So, af after kindergarten, where, where do we want our kids? What do we want our kids to know about digital literacy and, and information literacy? Um, how should they be exploring libraries at that age? And what should they be expected to do in first grade? So. That was something that um, I was able to work with work with the tech team that I, I'm working with now to really kind of parse down what we expect um, and then you know share that with with educators and share that with all of our teachers to say you know here's here's what we expect our kids because somebody asked me as, as somebody something as simple as you know well, when should we stop teaching typing um, and you know now when you think about it it's like well it's it's something that's still very essential because you look at you know, all these new state standardized tests are all coming online, and you know, high stakes testing, unfortunately, is is going to be a part of their their world for a, a long time to come. And it's a skill that it seems very basic, but it's also very important. Um, so I think we you know, you know we want to make sure we look at our standards and we look at our 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 teachers and, and our, our tech teams and, and realize that we just don't. We shouldn't just be throwing devices and, and things into into schools. Um, we shouldn't just be giving this stuff over. We should be really kind of pacing it um, and really not even worrying about the device, but make sure we understand that students are being educated first on this. And again, this is stuff that can happen across across all levels. And um, you know, you really don't need to have a one-to-one -one environment or five thousand Chromebooks. You you simply need just an open mind. Um, and, and I think a lot of it too also stems from strong leaders in the school um, that need to model this stuff and need to be open to opening up um, a lot of content for students and teachers that have access to this information, um, as well as trying to cultivate a, a culture of trust and transparency around the district, where you know both teachers and students can feel comfortable using technology that they're not like they don't feel like big brothers watching them, but they feel like they can work within a a comfortable situation that they're going to use this stuff effectively and um, appropriately, um, you know, at, at all times. So um, I've seen a lot of people even talking about the semantics of their acceptable use policies being changed to a responsible use policy or empowered use policy. I mean, whatever you want to call it, I'm sure um, there'll be a different name for those each week. But um, you know, it's something that you know you want to kind of change the connotation of what it means to be online and and. You know, it's not all bad. It can be very good, and I think we need to 
just ensure that we're, as educators, up to date and, uh, and current on all these things so that we know how to present them in our classrooms. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's a misconception, too, that digital citizenship needs to be begin to be taught in, you know, the middle grades when they first receive devices. So you're saying that it should be taught much earlier, even before. It's not really about the device. It's about the whole mindset. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really... Um, you know, it, it, it's really about getting kids, if, like if, you've already, if you start teaching it in high school, you're, you're too late. I mean, most of these kids have heard more digital content than we, we've even, you know, began to look at. And, and not only have access to it, but have created a, a host of digital content. Um, you know, one, one thing I always like to do with students, is, especially when I was teaching in the high school level, is is I would show them my Facebook page and I would put it up on, on the projector and I'd, I'd go through my pictures and I'd show them my family and I said, this is, this is who I am. This is my wall. These are my friends. You know, they look pretty normal and pretty bland. And then I would unplug my computer and I said, who's next? And, um, and that was a way of kind of saying like, well, you know, if you can't, if you can't share it with, within a, a you know, professional organization, what's, what's the issue here? Um, and so that's that's usually a very good conversation starter about uh, transparency, about you know, uh, students students kind of joke about like, oh, my mom friended me on Facebook. I'm like, well, that's good, and I think more parents should understand. Mm -hmm. um, and the other the other idea of uh, my friend uh, Michael Milton, uh, a former colleague at Burlington, you know, he always said it's he he tells he he would tell his students he was a history teacher or is a history teacher and. Uh, he would always say, he told the students to employ the Nana rule. So something like, if you can't say it to your Nana, you shouldn't put it on social media because, I mean, you're not going to say half. If you say half the stuff on, <laughs> say on Facebook or Twitter in front of your grandmother, it's, you, you know, you want to make sure it's, it's appropriate. So kind of always getting them to, to employ those, those ideas. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's something that I think we need to really embrace at, at the lower levels um, to really uh, understand what the very basic components are. I mean, years ago we used to learn about the basic components of a computer and what a computer was and how to save a file and and that was that was important. And and now we're in an age that's much more advanced. Um, you know, to get kids to understand about you know even something as simple as what is what is cloud-based technology? What is what does that mean to use Google Drive and, and stuff like this? So, I mean, I, I could go on and on with just all this stuff that students should have access to. But I mean. I have, I have, uh, you know, my cousins have kids and friends have kids, and you know, it's amazing when we're all together, and and it's it's amazing how many of their two, three, and four year olds are already pretty well versed on an iPad, and you know, it used to be that thing where it's like, well, it's like, oh, my two year old can use an iPad. I'm like, well, they sh they're kind of behind because there's a, a five month old over there using an iPhone, so you should probably you know, take that trophy down at the wall. Um, but it's, you know, it's something where I think, you know, like I said on, on this conference on Friday, I said most, ki most, most kids have a, have a digital dossier, have a, have a digital footprint before they're even born, before they even are alive in this world. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, pictures of, of sonograms I've seen online. I was like, wow, that kid doesn't even know that he or she is all over the place. And, and they're going to grow up and say, mom, what, what, why, why did you, Why'd you put me all over the place there? I kind of look dumb, and uh, so it's it's interesting to think about you know how these kids from day one. I mean, they're already they're already exposed to it, and they're they're a part of it. So, um, but I, I think we need to really make sure, like I said, embrace it very young. And 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 like I said, I could probably go on for days about different strategies and ways you can you can do it. But the basic thing is, it's just to get kids to understand a lot of these tools at a very basic level. I totally agree, and even in my own experience as a middle school teacher, just having students understand that anything that they post on there, the whole world can see, regardless of you know privacy settings, or it's just really going to affect um, their identity as they go on in life. Um, so, are there any other tips, final tips, or um, teaching strategies you have for teachers for digital citizenship? Yeah, I mean, and, and it's just kind of based off one one point you made there is. And something I observed in, in secondary secondary ed is um, is there's a certain vulnerability around uh, secondary students, specifically high school students, nine to twelve, when they get kind of caught up in the idea of they don't want to 
I think the assumption is that all students would want to have a blog or have some type of brand or, or be out there, but there are a, a host of students I know that, that really kind of have abstained from social media. Um, and the reason is because they realize and understand the how much pressure there is in, in comp competitiveness in, in college and, and getting accepted. And they realize that universities and colleges can see anything they have want. I mean, they can see this stuff if it's out there. And so even if students are posting their best work, some of them are, are nervous that it'll be misconstrued or, or taken the wrong way. And I think as, as educators, we have to be empathetic to that. I mean, I always, I always wanted my students to have a blog and be able to share something and have, a, have it used as a reflective piece. But I was also understanding of those kids that, that didn't want to use that and, and didn't feel comfortable in that area. So I think that's another point is, you know, as we we're working with more, uh, mostly secondary students, um, you know, f for us as educators to be empathetic to that, that's, you know, not every student's going to want to jump out and join Facebook. Not every student's going to want to jump out and jump on Twitter. Um, and that we need to, you know, also be understanding of, of them, what they're coming from. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely agree. Yeah, it's always based on the student's comfort level. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today and um, sharing your insight with us. Great. No, thank you for having me. This, is, this has been fun. It's been a, I always enjoy these because for me it's even like a reflective process. I'm like, oh, I just said that. That actually, I, I forgot about that idea. You know, so that's, it's good for me too to kind of share this and, and um, you know, I'm at Andy Sinek on Twitter. So if anybody's out there watching this and would want to ask any questions or follow-ups uh, on Twitter, you know, please please feel free to say hi and, and ask some questions. So, Yeah, and I think these will be great, too. We're going to try to do um, one hangout per week with um, different bloggers. So if you have any questions for Andy or for Remind 101, you can tweet at us, at Remind 101. And also, go ahead and check out Andy's blog, which is at blog.remind101.com, where we're sharing some best classroom practices about ed tech, about digital citizenship, and also some strategies um, to use Remind 101 in the classroom. Well, thank you, Andy. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it. All right.